Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of our God shall abide forever. Before we begin our study this evening, we need to make sure that we're in fellowship. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together as a body of believers to fellowship around the teaching of your word. We thank you for your, the truth of your word, that it illuminates us, informs us of so much that we would not know, so much that we would not understand if it were not for your revelation, your disclosure, your unveiling of these things. And Father, we pray as we begin this study of Genesis that you would help us to understand what you have revealed, that we could see its significance and how everything in Genesis undergirds so many aspects of our thinking and the way we look at life and the way we look at reality. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to begin a study in Genesis. And uh, Genesis has 50 chapters, and the way we go through books of the Bible at times, it seems like a, a 50-chapter excursion is, would take four or five years, and it just might. And it's easy to lose the forest for the tree, so I'm going to try an experiment with the way we approach the study of Genesis. And we'll probably apply this to some other longer books as we get into them. And that is to have uh, times, messages, where we look at broader sections and overviews. We'll label these tapes a little differently so that it would be possible to come along and pull the summary tapes. And it would be as if you listened to ten messages on Genesis that summarized and covered the whole book. And in ten hours you would get a, an overview of Genesis 1 through 50 or maybe pull the next level of tapes and in 50 or 60 tapes get a little more in-depth study and then uh, that would be punctuated throughout by detailed analysis and sections discussing various uh, points of doctrine in between. So that way we get to do uh, both the overview and the detailed studies and that's always important because too often, in, especially in doctrinal churches where we tend to do a tremendous amount of exegesis and analysis, it's easy to lose sight of the big picture. And yet all of the details feed the big picture and the overview of Scripture. And it's amazing how many of us are not up on our Old Testament as we should be. So for that reason, I like to do overviews before we get into the details of the text. So instead of doing my standard sort of introduction this evening, we'll start with an overview and then next time we'll begin to we'll get start getting into Genesis in terms of the introductory material. But nevertheless, we still have a few matters of introduction that we do need to cover as we begin our study of Genesis. First of all, the author. The author is Moses. Moses is the one who is who put together the final uh, rendition or the final edition of the Pentateuch. Now, that does not mean that everything in Genesis was originally written by Moses, as we'll see. There are numerous points. There, specifically, there are ten points in the Hebrew text where it uses a word that we'll study in a minute, toledot, and it's usually translated, these are the generations of, or this is the history of. And most scholars believe that these, these sections were taken from scrolls and oral history and written history that went all the way back to Abraham, uh, all the way back to Adam so that when uh, Moses was in the wilderness with the Israelites uh, during the 40 years that they were under divine discipline before the next generation could enter the land Moses had in his possession these earlier documents and under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit under inspiration he uh, took from those documents the information he needed in order to present the history of Israel. So Moses is the final author. He wrote between 1400 B.C. and or about 1446 B.C., which is the time of the Exodus, and 1406 B.C., which is about the time he went to be with the Lord. During that time, he, he penned the entire Pentateuch, which is a term that refers to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, sometimes referred to as the Torah or the Law, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. Uh, 
Now, the title Genesis, as we have it in our English Bible, is a, it really derives from the Latin Vulgate. The Hebrew title is, is taken from the first word in the first verse. It is the Hebrew word Bereshit, and it looks like this, B-E-R-E-S-H-I-T-H, Bereshit, and it's the preposition ba, meaning in, and then the term, the beginning. Now, it doesn't have a definite article there because in Hebrew, when you attach the, a, a preposition as a prefix to the word, it supplants or replaces the, the uh, definite article. So it should be translated in the beginning. That's the Hebrew title for the book. The Latin Vulgate derived the, uh, the title from the phrase found book of the, the book or the history of. It's, it's the translation in the Vulgate of Toledot, Biblos Genesios, meaning the book of beginnings. And as such, it emphasizes the origins of, that Genesis is the book of origins. Now, Moses writes this to Israel. This is important to understand to catch a framework for why Genesis is written. There are a number of reasons that we could come up with, but the primary reason is that Moses is sitting out in the wilderness with about 2 to 3 million Jews who are about to go into a land that God has promised them, and they're going to go into military conflict and take this land uh, forcibly from its possessors, the Canaanites. And so the question he is answering is, why us? What is our right to the land? What is the source of divine blessing? What is the historical basis for God's covenant with Israel? And so he goes back to the beginning. But the thrust of this book, the thrust of the book of Genesis, has to do with the beginnings of Israel. That's why it is divided the way it is. The first 11 chapters have to do with the beginnings of mankind, and then it is from chapter 12 to chapter 50 that you get the emphasis on four individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So if you just look at where the emphasis lies in the book, you can see that, that there's a lot of information, there's a lot of time covered in those first 11 chapters that Moses just seems to skip over and it leaves us with a lot of questions, and it leaves us with, uh, unfortunately for some people, too much room for speculation. But his thrust in the first 11 chapters is simply to provide an introduction to why God calls Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Now, Genesis is the book of beginnings, and there are numerous beginnings in Genesis, and I've listed 26 of them. It's the beginning of the space-time continuum before Genesis 1.1, there's just God in the third heaven. There is no universe. There's no such thing as space or time. And, and uh, the second, there's the beginning of the universe. He creates a space-time continuum, which is, a, which is a spatial location for the universe. And then third, it's the beginning of our solar system. Fourth, it's the beginning of vegetation and animal life on planet Earth. Fifth, it is the beginning of Earth as the home for the human race, not necessarily the beginning of Earth as a planet, but the beginning of Earth as a home for the human race. Sixth, it is the beginning of the human race, the beginning of the institution of marriage. We find the beginning of the institution of family. We find the first sin and the beginning of sin. We find the first judgment, divine judgment on sin, and we see the first announcement of God's plan of salvation. Twelfth, we see the beginning of law and a, the judicial system. Thirteenth, we have the beginning of economics, buying and selling, and principles that undergird or should undergird all economic theory. Fourteenth, we have the beginning of labor. Labor begins not after the flood. I'm not, excuse me, not after the fall. Labor begins before the fall. So we'll have two or three hours on the doctrine of labor. There is work and there is responsibility prior to the fall, but it does not become laborious until, <clears throat> until after the fall. We have the beginning of society and social structures. We have the beginning of language and learning. We have the beginning of cities and first urban development. We have the beginning of God's grace because man is no longer deserving 
and man is fallen. We have the beginning of animal sacrifice as a picture of the future work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's the beginning of music, number 20. There's the beginning of metallurgy, 21. There's the beginning of demonism, 22. The beginning of idolatry, 23. Uh, 24, there's the beginning of globalism and internationalism. And the first United Nations comes about in chapter, chapter 11. Uh, 25, there's the beginning of government and national distinctions. And then last but not least, there is the beginning of Israel, the Jews, as a distinct race. So that's a quick run-through. We'll see that more, more than you care to see in the coming weeks. Now, when you look at the overall structure of Genesis, there is a literary organization of the text that occurs in the Hebrew. It's not necessarily obvious in the English because the English translators do not always translate the Hebrew in the same way. The Hebrew word is toledot. Sometimes it's translated record, sometimes it's translated generations, sometimes it's translated history. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 we read, this is the history of the heavens and the earth. So there are various different ways that this phrase is translated, even by the same translator, depending on uh, various interpretive decisions and liberal presuppositions and and linguistic assumptions that go behind this. But the best way to understand this is these are the records of so-and-so, or this is what happened to so-and-so. And so these are structural markers that occur throughout throughout. Genesis. The first occurs in chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, or it should be translated, this is what happened to the heavens and the earth. After God creates the, creates the heavens and the earth, and, or recreates them actually, in Genesis chapter 1, and you have perfect environment on the restored earth, what happens? How did it get from perfect environment to the state it's in now? So the first statement is the Toledot, what happened to the original, or what happened to the restored heavens and earth of chapter 1. And that's covered from 2.4 to 4.16. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, we read this is, the, this is what happened to, this is the record of, or this is what happened to Adam and Adam's descendants. And that goes down to chapter 6, verse 8, which is where the flood is announced. And then in 6, 9, we have this is what happened to Noah. And we have there the story of the worldwide flood. Then in 10, 1 to 11, 9, we have this is the record of Noah's sons. That concludes with the episode at the Tower of Babel. Then from 11, 10 to verse 26, a short section, we have the records of Shem, the genealogy of Shem. This is what happened to Shem and his descendants. And that concludes with Terah, who was the father of Abram. And we have in 1127, this is the record of Terah. This is what happened to Terah and his descendants. And that goes down to the death of Abraham in chapter 25, verse 11. And then from 2512 to 18, another very short section, you have these, this is what happened to Ishmael. Uh, this is not tracing the line of the seed, but it's going to wrap up the loose ends related to Ishmael and his descendants. And then from 2529, or maybe that, I think I have a typo there, from 2519, 2519 to 3529, we have these are the, this is what happened to Isaac. These are the generations, or these are the records of Isaac and his descendants. And that includes Jacob from 2519 down to 3529. And then in 361 to 37, uh, one, or 30, yeah, 361 to 37, one, we have Esau. What happens to Esau from 36.1 and 30? It's repeated twice in 36.1 and 36. And that should read, there's a typo there, 36.1 and 36.9. But it, the actual section goes from 36.1 to 37.1 covering Esau. And then 
to, to the end of the book, 5026, we have these are the generations or what took place to uh, Jacob and his descendants, and that entire section focuses on Joseph. Now, it's difficult for English readers to get a handle on the organization of Genesis on just on the basis of these Toledot sections, but this is how the Holy Spirit revealed it, and so we need to keep keep in our minds that this is the underlying structure of Genesis. Other people come along and they organize it biographically, and they will start with Adam and then Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. What I like to do when I teach Genesis to, by way of an overview is to organize it in two basic sections. The first revolves around four events. This is the primeval history of mankind. Now, the word primeval means early or ancient. Early or ancient. So we have four events covering the primeval history of mankind or the Gentiles. Starting with creation, we have the story of the uh, original creation in Genesis 1-1, then the restoration in Genesis 1-2 to the end of the chapter. Then we have the story of the fall beginning actually in chapter 2, verse 5, and that sets the stage and extends down through chapter 3. Then we have the story of the flood and then the episode of the Tower of Babel. So if you can remember creation, fall, flood, Babel, you've got control of the first 11 chapters in Genesis, and that's the primeval history of mankind, the introduction to the book. Then the second section revolves around four people, four people, and this is the patriarchal history of Israel. So we have the primeval history of mankind in Genesis 1 to 11, and then we have the patriarchal history of Israel, Genesis 12 through Genesis 50, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So if you can remember these eight words, creation, fall, flood, Babel, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, you can remember the whole book of Genesis. You've got it under control, and you at least understand the basic structure of, uh, of Genesis. Now, what is the theme of Genesis? Because we will trace this theme throughout the, throughout the book. We find it in every chapter, and it's a, it goes back and forth, and that is the theme of blessing. Now, what is blessing? What does blessing mean? The blessing is the place in the Scripture. It's not just happiness. Sometimes we oversimplify and just say blessing is happiness. It is the place of life, real life, genuine life in relationship to the Creator, happiness, a uh, place of enrichment and prosperity. Especially in the Old Testament, there is a strong element of physical and financial prosperity and enrichment. In contrast to blessing, we have the theme of cursing, the, which is to be defined as the imposition of a barrier to life and happiness. And often this uh, cursing is judicial in nature, it is the judgment of God. You have cursing from divine discipline. You have cursing from uh, the natural consequences of evil decisions. You have cursing because of, of, of uh, divine judgment on the whole planet. So let's begin with the first section, which is an introduction. That's the creation and restoration in Genesis chapter 1 down through Genesis 2 verse 3. In this chapter, we see the beginning of the universe in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But, but there's something amiss by the time we get to verse 2, and it should be translated, but the earth became formless. Something takes place. There is now darkness on the planet, and, and this indicates that there has been some element of divine judgment. And then God begins to move. God the Holy Spirit begins to move on the face of the waters in verse 2. And there is restoration in the face of cursing. In the, uh, the face of cursing in the second verse, there is restoration and blessing beginning in verse 3. Specifically, we are told in chapter 1 that animal life was blessed, human life was blessed, and the seventh day, the Sabbath, is, are all blessed. There are three specific blessings in this first chapter. 
Mankind and human history begins in a state of blessing, a state of perfect environment, and a state of harmony with God. Mankind, we're told in verses 26 and 27, is created in the image and likeness of God. Man is created in order to represent God to the creation and to rule the creation. That's our first section is the creation. Then the fall actually begins in chapter 2, verse 4. And it is in this verse that we have our first Toledot. This is the history, or this is what happened to the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that God, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So at starting there, there is a record of what happens to this marvelous creation of God's that is, that is perfect in every way. And chapter 2, therefore, is, is a repetition of creation from a different perspective, and it sets the stage for chapter 3. The focal point of chapter 2 is the creation of man, Adam, and the woman, Isha, and the test of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It sets the stage for the fall, so it is the uh, precursor to the fall, and in that chapter we see the beginning of human responsibility, The first divine institution, we see the beginning of marriage, the second divine institution. So when we get to chapter 2, we'll have to spend some time on uh, the the divine institutions and studying them. Then we come to chapter 3, which is the episode of the fall itself. So there is the loss of the original state of blessing that is replaced by the curse on sin. Now, a curse from a biblical viewpoint, remember, is defined as a barrier that is erected uh, in in an imposition to prevent blessing. It is not a curse such as you might get from some gypsy curse or somebody who utters a curse and announces anathema on somebody. The curse in Scripture is actually God's announcement of divine judgment on people as a result of their disobedience to him. It is an explanation of the consequences of sin. The penalty for sin is spiritual death because Adam uh, disobeyed God. God had warned that the instant they ate of the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, they would certainly die. They died spiritually, but they did not die physically. He did not die physically for another uh, 930 years. So the curse that is outlined in Genesis chapter 3 is, a, is the outline of God's judgment for sin on the different people who were involved. There is a judgment on the serpent. And remember, the creation was originally created for man to rule over it, and this is a sign of the, the rebellion of the animal kingdom and a conflict that is going to now develop there. There is a second uh, announcement of the curse on the woman and the fact that she would now have sorrow and pain in giving birth, and this is uh, related to the original mandate that man was to multiply and fill the earth. And now that multiplication and filling the earth would be associated with pain and sorrow and, and uh, labor pains and difficulty. There would also be conflict in the marriage. Uh, the woman's desire, that is a desire to rule over the husband, would uh, enter in and he would rule over her in a tyrannical manner. So you have the beginning of conflict in marriage as a consequence of sin. And then man was also to till the garden, to take care of the earth, and now it would sprout thorns and thistles. There would be conflict between man and the cursed earth, and man would earn his living from the sweat of his brow. So responsibility and labor now becomes toilsome and laborious. Nevertheless, there is blessing in the midst of this cursing, and God explains the uh, plan of salvation In Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. And God teaches Adam and Eve about about sacrifice, and he clothes them with the skins of animals, which indicates that they had to be killed. Uh, Peter wouldn't like that, but nevertheless, God instituted the first animal sacrifice because it taught certain things about the... uh, about the redemption that Jesus Christ would accomplish. Now, the first Toledot covers the section from 2.4 down to 4.26, which, in terms of my outline, actually covers uh, more than uh, the simple 
more than the simple fall. It goes down through the early civilization section, uh, which takes place prior to the fall. In Genesis 3 and Genesis 4, you have the development of early civilization. And this shows the outworking of sin on the human race. You have the episode of Cain versus Abel in chapter 4, where Abel is obedient to God, Cain is disobedient to God, and as a result of Cain's disobedience, there will be cursing upon Cain, and he will be cut off from others on the earth. Uh, Abel is murdered, but he is replaced in terms of, uh, of a believer in the family line by the birth of Seth. Now, Adam has other children. He has other sons and daughters, and they marry one another. There's intermarriage at this time. There's no difficulty. There's no problem with marriage between siblings. In fact, there's not a law against marriage of siblings until you get to the Mosaic Law, and we'll discuss the reasons for that when we get there. Remember, Abraham married Sarah. Sarah they had the same father. They had a different mother. Uh, Isaac marries his first cousin. Uh, Jacob also marries a cousin. So there is, uh, in the early stages of the human race, when there were limited options, there was intermarriage within the family. This seems kind of strange to us, but when you look at what the options were, there, there weren't any. So you have the, in chapter 3, you have the development of chaos within the family as a result of sin. And there is cursing. Then you come to the second Toledot in 5.1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. This is where we start. Uh, I really have another section in here. This is the uh, chapter 5 really describes the, the area le leading up to the flood. This is the second Toledot. This is what happened to Adam. This is what happened to Adam's descendants, to Adam's progeny, and it begins with blessing. It reminds us of the status of blessing that Adam enjoyed at the creation in that day. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, blessed them, and called them mankind in the day they were created. And then you're reminded again and again as you read through this chapter that that blessing has been turned to cursing and you are reminded of death at every step of the way, that each of these men die, each one. So death and cursing pervades the fifth chapter. It is a reminder that the earth is not what it was originally created to be, and that the reason that there is evil, that there is suffering, and that there is death in human history is because of Adam's decision to disobey God, and the, that evil increases in the world during this time because men get further and further away from God. And the more that mankind disobeys God, the more they get away from the Lord, the more there is uh, a fragmentation of society and the more that chaos enters into human history. And this is exemplified finally by the time you get down to, down to uh, chapter 6 that you have a, an angelic or actually a demonic invasion of the human race, that there are, this is where we have the episode of the sons of God, and these are demons who saw the daughters of men and took them as wives. That's the foundation. This is a historical event that took place that is the foundation for all the mythology uh, that, that came along later that is simply a sort of a memory of this historical event. You have episodes where the gods like Zeus or or some, some other god uh, comes down and takes some uh, beautiful woman as his wife, rapes her actually, and then they have a, a half-breed son like Hercules. This is the beginnings. This founds, finds its root in the events of Genesis chapter 6. As a result of that, God makes a comment on man in verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of his th the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So there is no hope. The entire human race, with the exception of Noah and his immediate family and a few others who all die before the flood, uh, these few are the only ones who continue to obey God and continue to worship God. So the second Toledot ends in chapter 6, verse 8, 
with a note of hope, though. See, we've gone through a whole chapter and section that is a, emphasizes the cursing, the cursing, the cursing, the death, 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 and the evil of man. But, verse 8, there's a ray of hope. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, announces the extreme curse of catastrophic worldwide death, worldwide judgment on man through a, that will come through a worldwide flood. This brings up the third section, which is the where we're in the flood, which is actually the third Toledot, the Toledot of Noah that begins in chapter 6, verse 9, and extends down through chapter 9, verse 29. The Toledot of Noah, this is what happened to Noah and his descendants. Again, the theme is judgment. The theme is cursing divine judgment on the entire world with the exception of Noah and his family through the worldwide flood. But nevertheless, there is blessing in the midst of cursing. God's grace preserves a remnant in Noah. God's grace will preserve a remnant in Noah, and it is through that remnant and through Noah who functions as a second or a new Adam, this new Adam that God will begin to repopulate the earth and to fill the earth. What we see in the episode of the flood is a restoration of the chaos that occurred in the original primeval chaos of Genesis 1, verse 2, where the earth was covered with water. So the flood restores the earth to the primeval chaos of judgment on Satan back in Genesis 1, verse 2. Noah is a new Adam. He is set to populate or repopulate and refill the earth And at this point in chapter 9, God institutes a new covenant with Noah. He promises that there will be no more global watery destruction, that there will be meteorological stability uh, for the most part, and delegates responsibility to mankind to govern himself. So with the Noahic covenant, we have the beginning of the fourth divine institution, which is human government. Nevertheless, though God has blessed Noah and his sons, in verse 1 of chapter 9, God blessed Noah and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Man is still sinful. And in the end of the chapter, we discover that Noah uh, gets, gets drunk from the wine of his vineyard. And then there is this episode where he is lying naked in his tent and his uh, grandson comes in and covers him and and the interesting uh, the the ironic thing here there's an interesting twist at the beginning in Genesis 1 and Genesis 1 through 3 before the fall Adam and the woman are naked and they're not ashamed now nakedness is something to be ashamed of and something that should be covered and by treating that lightly uh, there is a uh, curse placed upon Canaan this clearly revealed In this very bizarre episode, it clearly reveals uh, the disrespect that Canaan has for his uh, for his grandfather, and it reveals certain uh, tendencies in his line that will become more evident, specifically in the Canaanites. Now, remember this: that when Noah wakes from his drunken stupor and he realizes what his uh, younger son has done, when when Ham came in to cover him. Uh, This is going to be emphasized in his descendant Canaan. When Ham comes in to cover him, Noah doesn't curse Ham. He curses the grandson, Canaan, because he knows that these tendencies that the father showed are going to be developed more fully through Canaan. Now, what's happening when Moses is writing this? Moses is is in the plains of Moab or out in the wilderness getting ready to, and, and and the Israelites are getting ready to go into the land and to take it forcibly and violently from the Canaanites. So at this beginning, you see that there is a rationale developing for why the Canaanites are not worthy to keep the land because they have become so perverse and so sinful that that it is now time for God to remove them in divine discipline. So there's three sons of Noah. There's Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham is not cursed, but his one of his sons, Canaan, is cursed because of his father's uh, misbehavior in relationship to Noah's drunkenness. Then the other two sons are are blessed. There is uh, Noah blesses uh, Shem in verse 26. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. 
May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. So there is a blessing on Shem, and most commentators relate this to the fact that it is through Shem that the Hebrews come, that revelation comes, that uh, the Bible comes, that redemption comes through Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ, therefore, is going to have an impact have, Christianity will have its largest impact on Japheth, the Gentile descendants that we would re- relate more, mostly to Western Europeans and North Americans are mostly descendants of Japheth. Now, this ends that section with the blessing and cursing, and you have the announcement of the curse on Canaan and the blessing on uh, Shem and Japheth. Then in chapter 10, verse 1, we have another Toledot. This is our fourth, fourth Toledot and our fourth section, uh, the Tower of Babel. Now, this is the genealogy. Or this is noted, If you notice, I keep reading the uh, New King James translation. It's always different. Now, this is the record. This is what happened to the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so chapter 10 Verse 1 down to 11.9 is going to tell us what happens to the sons of Noah as a whole. And this focuses on their failure to disperse and the cursing of the uh, division of languages, which begins national distinctions. And that's really our fifth divine institution is national distinctions. And that takes place with the episode of Babel, where instead of scattering and filling the earth as they were commanded to do, Mankind decides to unite. They're going to make a stand against God. They're going to disobey God. They're not going to be uh, voluntarily take control of the earth. So God has to scatter them and announces that judgment in 11.4. Then we come to the fifth Toledot, which is still part of the Babel episode, this uh, section between the flood and Abraham. The fifth Toledot is given in 11.10. This is the genealogy of Shem, or this is the record of Shem. This is what happened to Shem's descendants. So uh, from 10.1 down to 11.9, you focus on primarily the descendants of Ham, who are the ones involved in the Babel episode. Uh, it's interesting. We'll get to this when we get there. But, but there's more di- dispersion and more diversity among your Hamitic languages. Descendants of Ham would include uh, Japanese, Chinese, uh, all the African nations, uh, many, many other groups that are spread out around the earth, and there's much more linguistic diversity there. I mean, there's just no relationship to many of those languages. And then if you look at Japhetic languages, they're all basically what we call Indo-European languages, and we can trace those back. There's not, they're not as fragmented. And then when you get to the descendants of Shem, the Semitic languages, Arabic, Aramaic, Hebrew, Akkadian, Ugaritic, these languages are very closely related. So you see that the greatest division occurred among the descendants of Ham, and those were the ones who were most deeply involved with the Tower of Babel episode. So the focus is on the descendants of of primarily Ham and Japheth in the, down through verse 9, and then we get a narrow focus on Shem's descendants starting in 11.10. And this sets the stage for God's renew, renewal of blessing through the descendants of Shem. The uh, genealogy here goes from verse 10 down through uh, verse 25 where, or 26 where it talks about Terah, Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So it is specifically Abram through whom God's redemptive plan will uh, transpire. So this brings us to the second major division in the book where we talk about the four people, the patriarchal history of Israel. And this introduces the sixth Toledot, the sixth record, beginning with Terah in 1127, down through 2511, from 1127 down through 2511. And that whole section really tells the story of Abram, who is renamed Abraham. It is, again, an extension of the theme of blessing and cursing, but now it is localized to Abraham and his seed. In Genesis 12:3, we read, I will bless those who bless you, 
and I will curse those who curse you lightly. And this takes us to the to the Abrahamic covenant, which is specifically divided into three sections, the land promise, a seed promise, and a blessing promise. Land promise, seed promise, and a blessing promise. And pay attention to those three words because those three words, those three ideas, the land promise, the, the tracing of the land promise from generation to generation, the tracing of the seed, God's preservation of the seed through Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and then you find the motif throughout this last part of Genesis of how God blesses the descendants of Abraham, and he blesses by association those who are uh, friendly to them, and he judges those who are hostile to them. So the land, seed, and blessing motif is not only core to understanding the Abrahamic covenant, but it becomes critical in understanding the themes uh, that are developed in the next uh, 38 chapters, or 39 chapters, 38 chapters. Never was good at math. The sixth Toledot begins with Terah, and it begins with the announcement and the call of Abram, In chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, where God promises Abram a specific piece of real estate, a piece of land, he promises a seed that through him a great nation would be developed, and he promises a blessing to all of the human race through Abraham. Then, starting in 1210 down through 1521, the emphasis is on the land. God is going to develop this theme and show how he is going to protect the land and preserve the land for Abraham and his, in, and his descendants. So there's an emphasis on the land, and, and first there's a famine test. There's a famine in the land in, in uh, 1210, and Abram leaves with Sarah and goes down to Egypt. Rather than relying upon God, he decides, I'm going to handle the problem on my own, and he leaves the land. So God has to uh, work to destroy his human viewpoint strategy and to get him back to the land. Then in chapters 13 and 14, there is a problem developing with Lot, his nephew. And Lot and his herdsmen and Abram and his herdsmen don't get along. And so uh, Abram is to divide and separate from Lot and says, Lot, you take whatever land you want. And Lot says, hey, I want to go down where the cities are, down in the valley, along the Dead Sea, and and I like the party life down there, so I'm going to go down there. And then God told Abram, see, walk around the land. Everything that you see, everything that you, every place that you go, this is your land. So there is the promise of the land and the division of the land. And then in chapter 14, there is the invasion of the land, by the uh, kings of the east, Amraphel, Arioch, Keterleomer, and Tidal, king of nations. These four kings invade, and they uh, dominate the land for a period of uh, 13 years. And then they, uh, there's a battle between the five cities of the plain and the, these four kings that have invaded. And in that battle and in that brief war, Lot and his family are kidnapped and taken captive by Keterleomer, and it is up to Abraham to put together an army made up of all of his servants. Abraham was obviously an extremely wealthy man, and he put together an army made up of all of his servants, those who worked for him, and they took off and they destroyed the armies of the four kings. He came back, and instead of giving any tribute to the king of Sodom. He gives tribute by way of a tithe to an enigmatic figure introduced in 1518, Melchizedek. His name means king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem, which is now Jerusalem, and he is seen as a a religious leader. Some speculate that this is is, um, uh, Shem, that this is a name for Shem. Shem would still be alive if you trace out the genealogy of Genesis uh, 11, Shem would still be alive, and some speculate it could be Shem. There's no way of knowing. But Melchizedek remains this enigmatic priest-king figure who is a type or shadow image foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who will be a priest-king, who is a priest-king. So we have Abraham uh, 
uh, honoring Melchizedek, the priest king of Salem. And then in chapter 15, God reaffirms and confirms his covenant with Abraham. This is where the Abrahamic covenant is actually formally ratified. So there's an emphasis on the land. God continuously throughout this period says, this land is yours, this land is yours. I'm promising to give you this land. And as since Abraham understood that to be a physical piece of real estate, we should too, and that the boundaries are phys- physical boundaries that are still present today, the river Euphrates on the, on the east, the Mediterranean on the west, the Wadi El Arish, which is the river of Egypt. It's not the Nile. Most scholars believe it's the Wadi El Arish down just to the west of the Sinai. These are the boundaries. This would include all of the Sinai, most of all of modern Jordan, much of modern Iraq, much of modern Syria, um, Arabia. All of this is land that God promised to Abram. Since Abram understood it to be a physical piece of real estate, God hasn't switched on him. And so at some time in the future, God will fulfill that promise to Abraham. So that's the emphasis on the land. There's an emphasis on the seed in chapters 16 through 21. There is a human viewpoint solution to the seed in uh, the 16th chapter where Sarah suggests that Hagar, uh, the Egyptian slave, should be taken as Abram's wife. So he follows his wife's instructions, gets himself in trouble. Uh, Hagar is pregnant and she gives birth to Ishmael. And this, of course, is the beginning of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It goes back to this family division between Ishmael and Isaac. And in chapter 17, we have the introduction of circumcision as the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. This is to keep the line distinctive, that there would be a physical distinctiveness to the Jews because of, to the Jewish males because of circumcision. Then in chapters 18 through 19, we have the episode of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God and two angels come and visit Abraham, and they announce to Abraham they're about to destroy the cities of the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah specifically. Abraham pleads with them, if there's a righteous man there, don't judge. Don't judge them, God says, okay, and he sends these two angels to get Lot and his family out. This is the protection of the seed. God is going to prevent the seed from coming under the perverted influence of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then there's a second human viewpoint solution in chapter 20 where uh, Abram is living near the Philistines, and so he has Sarah uh, pose as just say that she's his sister. Actually, she's his half-sister, but she's to just call herself a sister. And Abimelech, who's the ruler of the Philistines, has a... a is very interested in Sarah, but God brings cursing on, closes the wombs of all the women in Abimelech's household as a sign of cursing, and he wakes up and knows something's going on and realizes that Sarah is actually uh, Abraham's wife. As a result of that, uh, he sends Sarah back to Abraham, and Sarah is kept from having possible sexual relations with someone else and interfering with the promise of the seed. And then in chapter 21, you have the birth of the seed, Isaac. Abraham is then tested in chapter 22 when God says to, uh, to Abram to take your son, your only son, and take him up and sacrifice him. Abraham is willing to do that, we know, from Hebrews 11, because he knows that God can raise Isaac from the dead, and he is te- he, his faith is now so strong that he understands that God will, God's plan will come to pass whether he sacrifices Isaac or not. God, of course, stays his hand, provides a substitute ram in the bush, which is a picture of Jesus Christ who dies on the cross as our substitute. Then we have the conclusion of this section in chapters 22 to 25 where Abraham purchases land for burial uh, for Sarah, and this is a sign or guarantee of future ownership of the land. Uh, The seed is protected because Isaac gets a wife, Rebekah, and then there is blessing. Abraham blesses Ishmael and sends him on his way, and this shows that God is going to protect the land from any kind of inheritance conflict and protect the seed from conflict with Ishmael. Then we have the seventh Toledot, which is in chapters 25 
12 through 18, just a few short verses where we tie up the loose ends related to Ishmael and his descendants. So that covers up to Abraham. Then we come to Isaac. Well, not much is said about Isaac. Most of what we know about Isaac is really told in terms of the story of Jacob. This is the eighth Toledot. Uh, 2529 to 3529 and covers Isaac and Jacob. Isaac and Jacob, 2529 to 3529. Isaac is 40 years old when he marries Rebekah. Initially, she is barren. This is a major theme that runs through here. The women are all barren, but that's to show that God is a God who brings life where there is death. He brings blessing where there is cursing. And due to Isaac's prayer and his dependence upon the promise to Abraham, God opens Rebekah's womb, she conceives, and the story of the seed continues. There's the struggle of the twins inside her womb, and then in chapter, in chapter 25, after they uh, grow to a certain age, um, Esau's out hunting, he comes in tired, he comes in weary, and Isaac's, Isaac's been cooking lentils all day, he's got a good bowl of lentil soup going, and Esau is starving to death, wants something to eat. So uh, Isaac says, I'll, I'll tr- make you a trade. I'll trade you a bowl of soup for the birthright. So Esau abuses his birthright, trades it for a bowl of pottage, and that shows that he has no concern or care for his inheritance in relationship to Abraham. Then as... Um, and then there's a test of famine. In chapter 26, Isaac keeps the family in the land, which is a sign of that he has learned something at least from his father's leaving the land during times of famine. Isaac stays in the land. He goes and he associates himself with the Philistines, and he is a blessing to Abimelech and others. So we see the theme of seed, land, and blessing. Then in chapter uh, 27... There's the wonderful story of the deception and manipulation to get the blessing where Isaac, uh, or, or the father uh, Isaac, tells Jacob, or excuse me, tells Esau to go out, go, go hunting, bring back some wild game meat, fix him his favorite meal. By this time, uh, Isaac is very old. He's blind. He, he can't hear well, but he wants his favorite son Esau to make him a good meal of wild game. So when Esau takes off, uh, Rebecca comes along. She must have been a very conniving, manipulative woman because she wants her favorite son, um, Jacob, to get the blessing. So she tells Jacob to go get a kid out of the flocks and kill it and bring it in, and she'll make the meal. And then she takes the skin and she puts it on, on Isaac's arms and hands because Isaac is smooth-skinned. Esau's a, a, an outdoorsman. He's he's rough. He's he's very hairy and uh, uh Isaac could tell the difference, so she she puts this skin of the of the lamb on uh, Jacob's arm, so that when he comes in, Isaac says, "Who is that?" Isaac says, "It's it's Esau, your favorite son." He says, "Well, come here. You don't sound like Esau. Let me feel you." So he feels his arms and feels his hands and says, "Ah, oh, but you feel rough and hairy like Esau," and you and he he put on Esau's clothes, so he smelled like Esau, and so Isaac is deceived, blesses. Uh, Jacob, and the manipulation works. Now, the thing is, God was going to bless Jacob anyway. So what we see here is God's grace and his, his, uh, his control of history uh, overrides all the manipulations and deceptions of mankind. So Jacob has to flee because Esau is understandably angry with him. Jacob flees to his relatives, the, the, uh, his uncle Laban, uh, over in the area of Mesopotamia, and there he finds a wife, Rachel, and the perpetuation of the seed. So now we come to the story of Jacob in chapters 28 through 35. We have his conflict with Laban, tremendous story here. Laban is just this conniving, deceiving, duplicitous man, just just cheats his, his uh, nephew any way he can. And remember Jacob's name, um, Yaakov, I mean, excuse me, Isaac's, Jacob's name means the the heel grabber, the deceiving one, Yaakov. And so he is deceived by his uncle Laban. So Jacob uh, wants to marry Rachel. Laban says, work for me for seven years and you can have her. So after the seven years, he gets married. But on their wedding night, uh, uh, Laban comes in and brings in Rachel's older sister, Leah. 
and uh, puts a veil over her so Jacob can't tell the difference. And Jacob wakes up the next morning. He's married to the wrong sister. So he uh, goes to Laban, and Laban says, well, if you wait a week, which seals the, the first marriage, I can't let the younger girl marry before the older girl, even if she is more attractive. And uh, Leah is not very attractive. You wait a week, then you can marry Rachel, but you'll have to work for me another seven years. Well, Jacob ends up working 14 years for the two women and then another six years to get his um, finances in order. And during that time, uh, Jacob is blessed by the Lord. His flocks, his herds all multiply despite the conniving of Laban. And finally, Jacob flees Laban. He needs to get back home. And he flees Laban, and God blesses and protects him and appears to Laban and says, Whatever you do, don't say anything good or bad to Jacob. Don't lift your hand against him. And so God protects Jacob. During this time, Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter, and these become the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. We have a chart on the overhead showing the line from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the two wives, Leah and Rachel, and their two slaves, Zilpah and Bilhah, who become the, father, the, the, the various mothers of the twelve sons. These twelve sons have no spiritual interest whatsoever. They're on negative volition. They're in rebellion against God. And when they get back to Canaan, they want to take Canaanite wives. Now, Abraham and Isaac and their wives, Sarah and Rebekah, had made sure that their children would not marry Canaanite women. That would destroy the line. But there's no concern here for maintaining a distinction from Canaanite culture among the 12 sons. They, uh, Judah marries a Canaanite wife. Several others marry Canaanite women. And this is why God is ultimately going to take them to Egypt, is to protect the line. Because in Egypt, the Egyptians hated the Jews. And they were extremely prejudiced against the Jews. They wouldn't even eat in the same room with a Jew. So they didn't want to have anything to do with it, and that would preserve the line so that there wouldn't be this intermarriage with the pagan Gentiles and introduce false religious beliefs into uh, this line of redemption that God was developing. So the ninth Toledot comes up then. At the end of this episode with Jacob, the ninth Toledot deals with Esau, and it's mentioned twice in 36.1 and 36.9. And in chapter 36, we have what happens to the descendants of Esau. Now, that's important because it establishes the identity of all of Israel's future neighbors. And then in chapters 37 to 50, we come to the story of Joseph, Joseph of the coat of many colors. And we have the various tests of Joseph. Initially, he's given these dreams and visions where he can understand uh, what God's plan is for his life. He tells his brothers because he's not very humble, and so he fails the humility test. They get angry at him, sell him into slavery. He's taken down into Egypt. Uh, this time there's an interlude, and Judah, one of the brothers who was wanted to kill him, is tested. Uh, he ends up uh, uh, having uh, uh, one, one of his sons marry Canaanite women, and then they die because they're so wicked and evil, God kills both of these sons. And Tamar, the wife of Ur, one of his sons, survives. Well, she's supposed to be married in levered marriage to the third son. Judah forgets all about that, so she prostitutes herself, disguises herself, and he goes to her as a prostitute. She gets pregnant, and then eventually comes back on Judah. It's a torrid little story, but it shows that that Judah, Judah's evil is judged and righteousness is established. Now, Judah is going to turn around as a result of that and become a hero later on. Now, the, then after that, you have a second cycle of testing and suffering. Joseph still remains faithful. He's sold into slavery, but he's faithful to Potiphar despite his wife's uh, advances on Joseph, and he is faithful to God. The uh, wife of Potiphar accuses Joseph of raping her, so she, he's thrown in prison. This is a furtherance of his tests. There, the uh, steward of Pharaoh and the baker of Pharaoh uh, have dreams. He interprets the dreams correctly, and he tries to get the butler that when you're freed, you know, tell Pharaoh about me and get me out. In other words, he's relying on his own scheming to get out of, out of jail rather than resting in the provision of God. Then after he is finally released, 
and because he correctly interprets Pharaoh's dreams about the future of Egypt, uh, Pharaoh elevates him to the second highest position in the land. There is a tremendous, there's seven uh, good years during which time he administers the kingdom and he builds tremendous storehouses. And then when the seven years of famine begin, all of the Middle East, everyone has to come to Egypt to get grain because he has done such an excellent job of storing the grain. Well, back home you have uh, Jacob and the boys are growing hungry, so Jacob sends the boys, except for Benjamin, the youngest, down to Egypt to get grain. So he sends them down to Egypt, and they come across uh, their brother, but they don't recognize him. So this is another test for Joseph. Is he, is he going to yield to mental attitude sins of vindictiveness? Is he going to want to uh, destroy his brothers, or is he going to treat them in grace and blessing? And, of course, he treats them in grace and blessing. And he, after they purchase all the grain, he has it loaded up on their donkeys, and then he tells his, his uh, servants to put all their money back inside the grain bags. Well, this was a test for the brothers to see if they've learned honesty. And as they head home, they discover they have all this extra, all their monies back in their bags, and they know they're going to get in trouble. But they go home, and they tell their father about it. And then when they run out of grain, the father sends them back, and they take all the money back to show their honesty. They don't know they're being tested. It shows that over time they finally got the picture and decided that they're going to have some integrity in their life. So they get back on the second journey, and when they went back, Joseph had told them that when they come back, Uh, Bring your younger brother. They had told him they had a father back in Canaan. They had a younger brother back in Canaan. And Joseph, who they still don't know is Joseph, tells them that they are to bring this younger son back. Well, of course, uh, Jacob doesn't want to release the youngest son. That's his favorite. He's already lost uh, one son. He thinks Joseph, he thinks, is dead. And uh, the brothers had had to leave Simeon there. Now, they were just going to leave Simeon hang out to dry there, it seems. But um, uh, Jacob sent him back so they could get... Simeon out of uh, out of Hawk, as it were, and they took um, they, when they returned, they brought all the money back they had brought they had been uh, that had been restored to them, plus more money to purchase uh, more grain. When they come back, the test that uh, Joseph has for them is will they still protect Benjamin's life? In other words, have they learned their lesson of brotherly love? And of course, they have. They pass the test, especially Judah, who says, "Look." Uh, even though you may want to keep Benjamin here because he set up a little test for him and he put extra extra gold and some goblets and uh, into Benjamin's grain bag so it looked like Benjamin was a thief. He basically framed him. And when they were brought back and uh, Joseph said he was going to have to uh, put Benjamin in prison, Judah, who, remember, had uh, learned his lesson the hard way with his, with his uh, daughter-in-law, uh, Judah demonstrates that he's finally learned something about character, and he says, uh, I'll take, "Don't if you're going to take his life, don't take his life, take my life." And this demonstrates that the brothers have finally learned a few things, and that concludes chapter 44. Then, in chapters 45 to 50, we have the epilogue, which shows how the Jews ended up in the womb of Egypt, um, and how God is going to protect them and preserve them in the midst of the famine and how God is going to use that time to make a great nation of them. All of that, of course, sets the stage for the beginning of the book of Exodus. Now, what do we learn from this? First of all, we learn that Jesus Christ controls history, that no matter what man does, God controls history. Second, we learn that blessing and cursing in history is ultimately related to God's plan for Israel. Blessing and cursing for nations and individuals is ultimately related to God's plan for Israel. And remember, cursing is specifically uh, promised to those who treat Israel lightly. Two different words are used in that passage. For cursing, those who treat you lightly, I will curse strongly. That's how it should be translated. And, of course, that relates to the fact that anyone who rejects Jesus as Savior will be harshly judged by God. So blessing and cursing in history is related to God's plan for Israel, specifically their relationship to the promised seed. Third, God's grace overcomes all obstacles. Evil plots, conniving, manipulation, mental attitude, sins of mankind. God's grace overcomes everything. Nothing is too great for the grace of God. And then fourth, 
God's plan of redemption cannot be thwarted by human schemes. God will bring about his plan of redemption. He will bring about our salvation because it's not dependent on who we are or what we've done, but it's dependent on who he is and what he has done. So that gives us our overview of Genesis. And next time, we'll begin with a more detailed look at the first section of Genesis with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to get this understanding of your grace at the beginning of human history and how despite human failure again and again and again, despite the fact that no human being deserves uh, an ounce of your goodness or your benevolence, nevertheless, because you are a God of love, you have always provided a solution. And ultimately, this is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross as a substitute for our sins. Father, we thank you for the things that we learned from this study, from the things that we will learn from this study. And we pray that you would help us to be challenged and respond to the challenge to the things that we learn. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.